Hello everyone. It is so good to be with you today. My name is Tanil and this is my husband Dusty. And we're a part of the full-time team here at City Hill Church. I really hope that we've all been staying fit and healthy during this time of lockdown. Because we're pretty sure our jeans may be just a little too tight after this. And I think my shoes have thought I've died. But to all our visitors who are joining us online, you are still so important to us. If you are joining us for the first time, we would love you to let us know by sending us an email to admin at cityhill.co.za. We would like to send you a cappuccino voucher that you'll be able to redeem once we are back together meeting in our building. And if you would like any more information about City Hill, you can check out our website, our mobile app, or our social media pages. So there's no doubt that our country is currently going through a tough time. There are even some communities around us that are not able to put food on their tables. We thank God for City Hope Disaster Relief and the Nation Changes team who have spent many hours packing and distributing food into these communities. Here's some facts that I think are going to blow your mind. By the end of today, these teams would have distributed 111 tons of food, 6,250 branded water storage buckets, 25,000 toilet rolls, 25,000 bars of soap, 8,000 bottles of sanitizer, 14 tons of delish porridge, 8 tons of maize meals. To date, 6,568 meal packs have been packed and handed out. Over 400 blessing packs have been handed out. And a total of 15,200 rand in vouchers has been distributed. Wow, isn't that amazing? We really want to thank all those who have been so generous during this time, and especially to the team who have been spending this lockdown packing and distributing all the food to these communities. You guys are amazing. As the teams work into even more communities, they are realizing that the devastation and the need is increasing. But the good news is we can help from our homes by donating to these incredible causes. So if you head to cityhopedisasterrelief.org or nationchanges.co, you will be able to see how you can donate. You can also keep up to date with what these teams are doing on their Facebook and their Instagram pages. As part of our worship today, we're going to bring our tithes and take up our offerings. I know that we're going through tough times as a nation, but as we look through scripture, there's this beautiful promise that God blesses the generous heart. So we've got multiple platforms that you can give on. The first one is you can give via EFT, or you can go over to our website and there will be a link there that you can give. Or lastly, you can use the Zappa code that's going to come up on your screen now. How amazing has this Jesus series been? We are currently in week five and Steve will be continuing the series from Matthew 16. But before Steve comes up, let's have a look at this video. Hey everybody, a huge welcome to today's service. And if you're visiting us online today, I really would like to echo what Dusty and Tanil said earlier. Just a huge warm City Hill welcome. Man, I am so missing being together as a local church meeting, glorifying God. But I know that time will come again soon. And in the meantime, I know that God's doing amazing work in our hearts and in our lives during this lockdown time. So I trust that you haven't grown despondent. I trust that you haven't given into despair that God is filling your heart full of faith, that he's teaching you things. I trust that you're not wasting the season, every season that comes at us. God's got lessons in that season that he can't teach us in any other season. So I trust that today no season is wasted, especially this season of lockdown. My title today is Looking for a Sign. And we're in part five of our Jesus series, and we're going back Back to Matthew 16 and 17, we've been looking at different passages in these two chapters. And uh, the verses I'm reading today are at the start of Matthew chapter 16. But before getting there, and in line with my title, uh, my mind went to some humorous church signs that I'd come across. 
And uh, some churches put up these signboards outside their buildings uh, just to engage, I guess, with passers-by. But some of them end up not intending what uh, the people who put up the sign to read meant. For example, this first one. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. I'm not sure that uh, that church exactly meant to word it in that way. Or how's the second sign that I came across? Again, not entirely sure that the pastor of that church intended it to come across as it was seen there. Or this third sign that I came across. Whoever stole our AC, our air conditioning units, keep one. It is hot where you're going. And this fourth sign really just uh, tickled my sense of humor. Prophecy class canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. I'm sorry, that's just my uh, odd sense of humor taking us down a little bit of a rabbit trail. But a sign essentially is there to give us information or to point us in the right direction. And when, whenever I'm in Johannesburg, if I've driven up there, often I fly, but when I've driven up there, there's one signboard that I really, really love. And it's this sign over here. There's a big intersection as you're leaving Johannesburg. And the word that always stands out to me on that sign is Durban, because that is home for me. And essentially what the signboard is telling me is that if you take that left-hand turn and go towards Durban, you're on your way home. But if you follow the Kimberley Bloemfontein for the sign, you're headed in completely the opposite direction. With that in mind, let's go to today's text, which is Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 through to 4. The Pharisees and Sadducees, those were religious leaders of the time, came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, this had happened a few times to Jesus. And essentially, the religious rulers were looking for a way to try to get him to validate himself as if the miracles he had done weren't enough. Raising people from the dead, healing blind eyes. They were asking him, give us a special sign from heaven that we can believe that you're the one. And listen to Jesus' reply. He says, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it. And this is really interesting. Except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. No sign will be given you except for the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. Jesus doesn't engage with this idea of asking for a sign because he knew they weren't asking it with any faith. But he says, if you are going to have a sign, go and look at the story of Jonah, which is really, really interesting. Jonah is one of the stories told in the Old Testament in the Minor Prophets. It's just got four chapters in it telling the story of this prophet, a guy named Jonah. And so if Jesus thought Jonah was so important that he held Jonah out as a sign, I thought it would be a good thing for us to do today is to dip into the story of Jonah and find out the signs that it has for us. There are many of them. I've just picked three for today. But maybe before we dive into that, I can give a little bit of a background. Jonah was a prophet. He lived in Israel. And as we'll read in a minute, God came to him and he said, Jonah, I've got a message for you, but it's not for the people of Israel. It's for the city of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was hundreds of miles away in modern day Iraq across very, very dry desert country. And he gave Jonah a very short message. In fact, it was an eight word message. And he said, you need to go and give this message to the city of Nineveh. At that time, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. So just as Rome was to the Roman Empire, Nineveh was to the Assyrian Empire. Nineveh was big. It was bustling. It was happening. It was pretty large by the standards of the day. There were 120,000 people in the city of Nineveh. And we read that in the book in the last chapter. And so Jesus says, you go back and look at the story of Jonah, and that's the sign that will be given you. Now, just a little tisanhakis here, a little in parentheses. Many people struggle with the story of Jonah because they say, how could it have happened? Jonah was the guy 
who got thrown overboard in the ship and got swallowed by a great fish, according to Jonah 1 and Jonah 2. Many people say, well, how could that have happened? That just proves that the Bible is a bunch of nonsense. It, it doesn't all tie up together. What's really interesting is that Jesus himself believed the story of Jonah. And he said Jonah is actually the sign. In Matthew 12, he picks up two aspects of Jonah's story. One of them, he says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights, speaking about his death, his burial, and then his resurrection. So Jesus believed that the story of Jonah actually happened, which makes the book even more important for us to realize. Now, I'd like to suggest today that there's three signs that we take from the book of Jonah. And these are the signs, I've picked all words beginning with an R. Signs of reluctance, repentance, and revival. Reluctance, repentance, and revival. Let's start with the sign of reluctance that comes from the story of Jonah. The sign of reluctance. The opening words of Jonah's story go like this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Jonah, you go to the great city of Nineveh. It's a very wicked city. Its wickedness has come up before me, God has said, and you go and preach against it. And we'll come to Jonah's message in a moment. It was a message of destruction. God is not happy with you. And verse two, uh, verse three at least, it says this, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Now, this, this sets up an amazing chapter because in the rest of chapter one, it gives us the story of what happened because of Jonah running away from God. Now, just a comment. What this tells me is that God's eye was not just on the nation of Israel, but it was on every nation and every city on the earth. And he says, Jonah, I've got a message for that great city, that wicked city of Nineveh. You go in that direction to where Nineveh is. Tarshish, you'd never guess, was in the completely opposite direction. In fact, it says Jonah went down and bought himself a ticket to climb on a ship and sail in the completely opposite direction. Nineveh was over land. Tarshish was across the Mediterranean Sea. Jonah went 180 degrees different to what God had told him to do. And in some ways, it's understandable if you view it through his eyes. Nineveh, as God had told him, was a very wicked city. It's unlikely that a prophet preaching a message of destruction would have been welcomed there at all. We know from history that Nineveh was very wealthy and it was very wicked. As the capital of the Caesarean Empire, it had accumulated great wealth, but it was also exceptionally hardcore. I mean, possibly a modern day example could be to be told to go to uh, Baghdad, the capital of Iraq during the time of Saddam Hussein and preach there. God is not happy with you guys. There's massive judgment coming on the city. We see in history, these are some of the things that were written as boasts by the leaders of Nineveh at that time. It, it, one person wrote, I flayed all the chief men who had revolted and I covered the pillar with their skins. To flay somebody means to peel the skin off their body, starting at their head, while they are still alive. It was an incredible form of torture and pain. I'm pretty sure Jonah didn't want to go and get flayed, have his skin removed while still alive in the city of Nineveh. Another guy said 3,000 captives are burnt with fire. A another person wrote this, their corpses are formed into pillars. In other words, you get the picture, Nineveh was a bloodthirsty, violent, and vicious city. And it's almost understandable that Jonah is very reluctant to go to Nineveh. But he doesn't even have a discussion with God about this. He just heads in completely the opposite direction. And you see, what happens in the story, we see that Nineveh was considered dangerous. So Jonah headed for what he thought was a safe place. Tarshish. But as it turned out, the journey towards the safe place was far more dangerous than the journey towards Nineveh. The safest place, we could say, is right in the very center of where God wants you and I to be. 
most of us have got this bent in our heart to look after number one. We want to live a safe life. We want to live a comfortable life. And God's word sometimes comes into the middle of that comfort and he says, I want you to do something that's uncomfortable. I want you to go somewhere that you wouldn't ordinarily pick. I want to put you on a path that is not necessarily the easy path. The one with just the angels and the rainbows and the violence. There's some hard work ahead of you. And inside of every one of our hearts, there lives a Jonah who says, I would prefer to head in the opposite direction. Thank you, God. Jonah boards a ship onto the Mediterranean. You would think this idyllic Mediterranean cruise is coming up. But it says this, God sent a storm. And that ship was in danger of sinking. The storm grew worse and worse and worse. The sailors of the ship eventually say, guys, who's done what? And it turns out that Jonah gets picked and he says, I'm running away from God, the maker of heaven and earth. And eventually Jonah says, guys, the only way to solve the storm is to throw me overboard. So Jonah gets thrown overboard and it says God provides this great fish to rescue him. And all the sailors are saved. They saved from the great storm. But the storm was so violent outside of God's will that Jonah nearly died from the storm more than he died, more than he came into danger from going to Nineveh. I'd like to suggest that Jonah's reluctance is like a great big warning sign. When I did my learner's license to drive a car, I was taught that any sign that's got a triangle shape is a warning sign for a driver. And I'd like to suggest that Jonah's reluctance is a great big triangle shape for every single Christ follower. It's a sign for us that disobedience to what God's calling us to do puts our lives in incredible danger. You see, God has always got our best and the best of the Nineveh in mind. Even though it might look more dangerous, with God in control, and him in charge of the situation, being right in the center of his will, is by far the safest place in this world to be. The greatest threat to Jonah was not Nineveh. It was his own disobedience. The reason I'm making much of this today is that I'm so conscious for every single one of us. We are wired with this desire to control our own lives and to control our own destiny. And left to our own devices, we'd always pick the Mediterranean above the path that God has sent us on our way to Nineveh. And Jonah cuts down through history, cuts down through the ages right down to 2020. When all of us find ourselves in a place we wouldn't have picked the coronavirus and the lockdown. And in that place, in that season, God is giving us instruction. He's giving us guidance. He's showing us things. He's perhaps even leading us into our future. Let's be cautious never to pick the path that just seems the easiest and is the most comfortable, but always to be searching for the very center of God's will. This has been a great challenge to me on so many occasions in my life, this idea that God's will is the best path for me. And there's been a continuous revisiting over time. I'm not saying it's not daily, but every now and then coming back to this point of me personally saying, God, everything that I have, everything that I am belongs to you. I want to remind myself that I am submitted to your will and to your ways. And wherever in the world you want to send me and my family, I want to say yes to that in advance. And whatever you tell me to do with your money that's in my hand, my personal finances, Whatever you want to tell me to do with regards to my future, God, to the best of my ability, I want to obey. I don't want to get to the end of my life and look back and see that continually when I reach the fork in the road, instead of picking the destination back to the Father, to what He has for me, I was continuously picking the Blumfontein, the Vereniging, not against those towns, but you know what, the metaphor, continually picking the pathway that I thought was best, but taking me away from your will and from bringing me to where I needed to be. I hope that the sign of Jonah's reluctance brings you and me again today to a place of full surrender, saying, God, all that I am, all that I have is yours. The second sign that comes from the story of Jonah is the sign of repentance. This is a strong word, the sign of repentance. 
Now, back to the story of Jonah. Eventually, that fish vomits him up on the shore. And it says, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. Jonah, go to Nineveh. And so, about as reluctantly as a man could go, Jonah begins this long journey across to Nineveh. And it tells us in chapter 3 that uh, Nineveh was this large city, about three days to walk through it. And Jonah goes about one day's walk into the city and he begins to preach this message. It's just got eight words. He says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. This isn't a message of grace and love and peace. There's nothing. It's just 40 more days, six weeks, and Nineveh will be destroyed by God. Can you imagine carrying that message into Nineveh where you know these guys are bloodthirsty? These are vicious, violent people who don't serve the God that you serve. And you arrive, this foreign prophet with an accent. And you walk one day's journey into the city and you say, guys, I've got a message from God for you. 40 more days and you'll be overthrown. Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 says to the people around him, he says, someone greater than Jonah is here speaking about himself. And you see, Jonah the preacher preaching repentance, a message of repentance, is a sign pointing forward to Jesus, the preacher preaching a message of repentance. And listen to Jesus' message. This is in Matthew 4 and verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, repentance has got two aspects to it. The first one is to turn. In, to turn my direction. And the second one is to change my mind. And those two ideas are interlinked. But what's really interesting is that every time the message of repentance was preached in the Old Testament, it was generally linked to this as a follow up is you need guys, we need to turn back to God and get rid of our idols. When Jesus's message, now this isn't just a message for 2000 years ago. It's an eternal message through the ages to you and to me. And Jesus' message says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, dot, dot, dot. And if you don't, you will suffer the consequences, just like Nineveh would have suffered the consequences. And embedded into Jesus' message of repentance is he's calling to every one of us, to our hearts, to turn away from our idols and to turn and follow him wholeheartedly. This isn't just a one-off moment, but it's rather a continuous turning and changing of our minds. We said last year in our series on idols, that an idol is anything in our lives that is more fundamental to our happiness, meaning in life, or our identity than God is. An idol is anything that is more fundamental to our happiness, our meaning in life, or our identity than God is. And secondly, we said this, an idol is anything we love more than God or rest our hearts in more than God. An idol, therefore, is not something that is bad. An idol is just something that is misplaced. A good thing misplaced becomes an idol, becomes idolatrous. An idol can be our careers, our family, our children, our spouse, our achievements, some cause, your own physical appearance, romance can be an idol, human approval, power, comfort, financial security, almost anything. And what Jesus' message down through the ages is, the message of Jonah and the message of Jesus, is turn, repent, turn from those idols and put Jesus Christ at the center, put him at number one and everything else follow second to that. Now, here's the interesting thing about a time of isolation like we're in at the moment in a time of lockdown. Our hearts tend towards our idols. Our idols are the things that we think about the most or we worry about the most or we fear losing the most. And this is hugely challenging because in a time of uncertainty, it's like our our minds want to go there. We want to grab hold and worry of those, about those things and, and draw comfort if we feel more secure or we draw panic if we feel less secure. And in the middle of all of that, Jesus preaches a message to us and he says, repent, turn away from idols, don't let anything, your future, your financial provision, romance, 
your family, where you're going to live. Don't let any of that come ahead of me. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And an idol is always letting go of something smaller to grab hold of something greater. And while our hands are holding on to our idols, we can't fully take hold of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so out of love, he says, let go of the idols. Just like a parent would say to his child, let go of the knife because it's going to cut you and it's going to hurt you to grab hold of the food, what's going to sustain you. Jesus says to us, turn away from your idols, the thing that you worry about the most, that you fear the most, you fear losing the most, that you, your comfort, your identity is placed in. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. What idols do you and I need to put away at this time? What are the things that we fear losing? What spaces have our hearts drifted into that our minds are constantly grasping at those things, trying to draw some kind of certainty, some kind of grace, some kind of identity from those things? You see, maybe this time of lockdown is one of Jesus' greatest gifts to us if it takes our hearts away from our idols and brings them back to Him. The third and final sign is a sign of revival. What is incredible in the story is the response of Nineveh to Jonah's message. You would think with that kind of message, 40 more days and you're going to be destroyed. That city would have stoned Jonah, but, he, but they don't. In fact, it says this in Jonah 3 and verse 6. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. And then he gives this instruction that every person in Nineveh was to do the same and no man or no animal was even to eat and they were to call out to God for mercy. And an incredible thing happens. It says God relents from sending disaster. He relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. What this tells me is that there is no city too tough for God to reach. There's no country in the world too difficult for the gospel to break into. There's no heart too hard that God cannot change. If the king of Nineveh could turn to God, so could just about any other person in history. And so the sign of this citywide revival is a sign to you and I. This reluctant prophet, you've got to know Jonah was so reluctant to be there. He was so angry at God. Jonah 4 tells us, he says, God, I knew that you were going to have mercy. That's why I didn't want to come. And God had to bring about a personal revival into Jonah's heart to see that because God is so gracious and so loving and so compassionate, he wants to revive the hearts of people. He wants to bring people's hearts back to him. When I was a boy, I read a book called The Cross and the Switchblade. It was the story of a man named David Wilkerson who worked into uh, gang-filled areas, in particular New York City. And uh, he eventually started a church in New York City, which is going to this day. David Wilkerson passed away a few years ago, but he was a man who had a very rich ministry experience. And in 1986, he said this. He had this prophecy. He said, I see a plague coming on the world and the bars and church and government will be shut down. I see a plague coming on the world and the bars and church and government will be shut down. The plague will hit New York City and shake it like it has never been shaken. The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles. And repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit. And out of it will come a third great awakening that will sweep America and the world. I don't know about you, but this is an amazing prophecy in 1986 that we in the year 2020 have got a plague that is sweeping the world and bars and government and church have been shut down from public meetings. New York City is the epicenter currently of where this plague is hit. And David Wilkerson's prophecy, his prophetic vision was that this plague would force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles and that repentance would be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit and that from that God wanted to bring about a great awakening 
that would sweep America and the world. Our nation and the nations of the earth are in desperate need of a great awakening. Men and women, by and large, are far more interested in pursuing their own comfort, pursuing their own careers, pursuing their own lives, pursuing their own pleasure, than they are pursuing the will of God. And when I read this prophecy of David Wilkerson, something resonated in me. And there's a deep cry in my heart that says, God, pour out your spirit on our land. Pour out your spirit on the nations of the world. Use us as the Jonas, not the reluctant version, not the disobedient version, but passionate Christ followers. And we want to be the people that carry your message. We want to be the people that are on your mission. We want to be the people that carry the message of your love. And the message of repentance and the message of forgiveness and the message of purpose and the message of passion. We want to be the people who stand up and say, God, in this day and in this age, in our lifetime, we want to be counted by you. We want to be those that see cities turned the right way around with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says to the people around him, he says, you, go, you want a sign? You go and look for the sign of Jonah. And we go to the story of Jonah and we realize that it's a story of God's mercy. And it's a story of God's grace. And it's a story of God's power. The power to change the human heart. There might be men and women that you've been praying for that they would come to a knowledge of Christ. And up till now they haven't yet. And Jonah is a sign not to give up. Because God can soften the hardest hearts. He can turn people back to him. And I believe that God is using this time in human history to bring about a great awakening, to stir the hearts of men and women back to him that we would look back on this decade coming up, the 2020s, as a decade where the Spirit of God moved across our nation and the nations of the earth in great power. Friend, today, if you're watching this, you might have been invited into the lounge by friends or by family members and you have not made your life right with Christ I'm asking you that you would like the King of Nineveh take my message today seriously and say, God, if this is true and I need to repent or suffer the consequences, I want to turn my life and follow you wholeheartedly. I don't want to go on the pathway to my own destruction and a life of self-determination. I want to follow the sign, the sign of Jesus that brings me back to the Father. And if that's you today, I would like to invite you right now to close your eyes together with me and to pray this prayer of full surrender after me. If you could join me, please. Lord Jesus Christ. You pray that out loud after me. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for doing things my own way. You have sent me a sign. Jesus Christ. Showing me how much you love me. And today I repent. I surrender my life to you. I ask you to save me and to change me. I want to follow you for the rest of my life and be a person who points other people to Jesus. And Father, in line with that prayer, I pray that for every single one of us that are watching this, you would right now through this message, show us what are our, what are our personal idols that we could turn from them. Turn our hearts and our minds towards you. That Jesus Christ, you would always occupy number one position in our hearts and our affections and our identity. We pray, furthermore, that you would use this time of lockdown and of this plague sweeping our planet to bring about a great awakening, turning the hearts and lives of men and women to you. People that have grown cold in their faith, that they'd become red hot. And those that have never known you that would turn their hearts to you in repentance. We want the signs of reluctance and repentance and revival from the book of Jonah to stir us today in 2020. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Friends, before we finish today, whatever God's doing in your heart, we'd love to hear about it. And please contact us through any of our channels, but particularly through email admin at City Hill. If you put your faith in Christ for the first time today, please write. Please tell us your story. We'd love to hear it. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend and an amazing week ahead. 
God bless you.